I know there's going to be more bags. Yeah. So it's not about the money. It's more about the long-term play and making sure that my brand has real value. Because if I just start co-signing anything and everything, the fans see that and that damages the brand. Long-term, that means the bags are going to get smaller, they're going to dry up, and people are going to stop hitting you up. What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you stream your podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency. You know, this is no labels. And always we're trying to find conversations and people who represent the no labels, no rules concept, people who are doing things differently. And today, someone who's a great representation of that. Cato on the track. What's up, sir? What's up, gentlemen? What's up, man? How are y'all? Pretty good. No hard complaints. Hey, man, it's, it's glad to have somebody um, good to have somebody in the building who who is so accomplished from an indie perspective, man. Thank you, man. You, you, you have you're, you're someone to admire. Have you moved on social and done it right? Right. Where you got the business together yeah. and the, the marketing together with the content. Yeah. Got 500 million streams over the last couple of years. Yeah. That's nothing to sneeze at. That's a lot of streams. That's yeah. a lot of streams, <laughs> man, which we, we need to get on that because, you know, you're, you're not the flexiest individual, but I, I want to flex on people for you. You yeah. know what I mean? Some of the things that you've accomplished that I think is really, really dope. I think you were in the top, was it five on TikTok streams? Most viral sound songs in the world. And this was during the pandemic, during yeah. COVID. Yeah. Um, which was weird. It was like a lot of big moments happened for me during mm. that period, during yeah. COVID. Uh so yeah, it was it was just a wild experience. Hey, well, you know, that time. See, so, you know, I feel like he's gonna get the podcast like blocked because he said said the word. Oh, you know what I mean? Who know, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but that was a period of time that made people make a lot of life decisions, right? Yeah. Good, good or bad. But yeah. um, I and you have to figure out what's what's uh serious or not. But I think today. One, of course, we got to get into your content strategy because you kill it with content and people will get a lot of value from hearing your perspective on that. Um, also, just the business as a producer. But of course, there's some other conversations that are on money and how you look at money as a mm. producer that I think is going to be really important. And what people will see the real purpose of this podcast. But we'll we'll, we'll wait to get to that. I want to start with the streams. Because one of the conversations I've seen around you was mm -hmm. I think you had you showed your method. It was a post. You showed your method of how you create viral tracks. Right. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that method? Because after you explained that method, there was some controversy around. It and that's the part I want to get to. Yeah. Yeah. So, first of all, like I was uh, I was one of those people who was hesitant to get on TikTok. This was probably around the end of 2019. Um, and I had a TikTok account, but I wasn't really posting. I wasn't really active on it. And I just remember at that time, my business partner, Benson, he was like getting on me about it. He was like, yo, you need to start posting on TikTok. And so it just had me thinking like, what can I do on TikTok that would set me apart from, from everyone else? And I just spent more time just scrolling through the app, just looking at what people were posting. And I noticed a lot of these posts were like the split screen posts where people were duetting videos that other one, everyone that other people were posting. Yeah. And I was like, man, what if I, what if I uploaded my beats? Like I just posted my beats on TikTok, and people could duet my beats and just drop like a quick freestyle or whatever. And I didn't see anyone else doing that at the time. Like nobody was posting their beats on TikTok. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do that. And the second beat, the second or third beat that I posted was the So Pretty beat, mm -hmm. which became the So Pretty Challenge yeah. and massively viral. I mean, got billions and billions of impressions. And uh, yeah, it started from that beat that I posted. So that kind of became my strategy and formula. It's not really, it's not even really a strategy 
It's just like I post my beats. I let people drop a verse or duet it. Mm -hmm. And that to me was, um, that was like, that became my thing. Like people started to know me as that producer on TikTok that they had duetted, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is which is crazy because I, I just remember we actually talked about this on an episode. Yeah. Because yeah, that conversation was some people basically saying that's not you're losing the art doing it in mm -hmm. that way. You know, you're letting you're trying to build something just to go viral. And if it's all based on virality, it's not really creative. You know, that whole conversation and how it goes. What's your response to it? I mean, look, I don't I don't look at that. That's why I say it's not really a strategy, right? Like uh -huh. I'm not looking at TikTok as something that can um, something that can turn into like an amazing piece of art. I was looking at it more so as like, all right, this is a tool for me to find new artists mm. that I can reach out to and work with behind the scenes, but like let TikTok be the driver for the traffic. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah. For the eyes, for the attention. Yeah. And like, you know, if we can get people's attention on the app, we know how to turn that into uh into a long-term play right so that's how i was looking at TikTok. Yeah. it was like the top of the funnel right we're getting people we're getting people's eyes and ears and attention in and meanwhile behind the scenes like we're working on a full song or like an ep together and that's that's how i see TikTok. like it's it's more about finding the talent yeah, that's how you know these artists are picky too, man. If you had just dropped the beat with a big artist, the complaint would have been, oh, he's like every other right. producer just working with big artists. But to me, that was what was cool about it was that there were a couple of videos I watched where you could see the artist was just like someone with like 50 followers or 100 followers or something. And yeah. like you literally launched their careers or launched them to a point where, you know, the platform at least took them seriously. Yeah. yeah, yeah, bro. I mean, so pretty, like that started from a beat that I posted and a girl that duetted that beat from Melbourne, Australia. She was 18 years old. Mm. That was the first song that she had ever made in her life. It's crazy. Wow. And it became top five most viral songs in the world on Spotify. So, and then she got signed by Universal. She got signed by Steven Victor. Um, it changed her life, you know? And now she has an opportunity to turn that into making it her full-time career yeah. you know which is amazing like who wouldn't want that yeah off of tiktok off of tiktok <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah man I, it's crazy to me because one is like hey kato's putting this beat up like the art has already happened to me right from the beat yeah. side right it's not like you're creating the beat based on what they're doing like yeah. they're just adding whatever they do on top of it right anyway and the way you just broke things down, you look at it as traffic. I think that's something that people aren't yet accustomed to in terms of using the content as traffic and separating that that way, where you can have your more quality content right. and your lower quality or easier to create content that doesn't necessarily brand you in the way that content used to, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a double edged sword, right? Because if you're if you're only reliant on TikTok to get people's attention and to keep their attention, mm -hmm. that's that's almost a losing battle, right? You got to be prepared for what comes after that. Like if if you don't have any more songs or you don't have any more beats or any music after that big TikTok viral moment, then those people are just going to move on to the next thing, right? Mm. So you have to be ready for that moment. And I was ready for it. Like we had, you know, I had follow-ups after So Pretty happened. Um, and I was working on a lot of music at that time too. So, you know, we had records stacked up. We had other plays ready to go in the pipeline after that happened. So, yeah, that's how I looked at it. Had you had a moment in your career that had been 
that wild in terms of attention and feeling of success because you had been in the game for a while. I know you had some ups and downs. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the whole label implosion and everything. But it was was that the first time you experienced that level of tension on Kato specifically? Yes, 100 percent. Yep. That was the first. Uh, that was the first moment that was like where I was at the forefront of my own music. Mm-hmm. You know, it put me in front of a lot of people. Um, you know, in the past, it was like people might have heard my my production, my beats. Um, but I was more, I was more or less like the behind the scenes producer. Yeah. And so I was trying to get to that moment where like I was at the forefront, like I was, I was becoming the face of my own brand Mm -hmm. and I had more control over my own brand. And so I think that that TikTok moment definitely helped. That's interesting, man. More control. I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah. Being in a producer's shoes. Can you speak a little bit more on that? Yeah, because like traditionally, right, producers are kind of in the background, Mm -hmm. like, and they have to cater towards a lot of what, you know, the artist may want or what the label wants, or they're not fully in complete control, especially when it comes to the monetary side of it, right? Like getting paid. Traditionally, producers get their checks cut from someone else. You know, like the label's cutting your check, the publisher's cutting your check. You don't get to be in control of your own destiny as far as like how you get paid. And I didn't want that because that shit is stressful, bro. (laughs) Like not being in control of your own financial future and security, that shit is stressful. And I didn't want that. So I was like constantly trying to figure out ways how I can control my own destiny as far as like the financial side of it. And what it comes down to is just having your own brand. You got to build your own brand. You have to build your own business. And I think the the publishing and the and the checks and the royalties that can most definitely be a part of it. But it's really really hard to make that your main thing and be in full complete control of your own business because mm. someone else is cutting your checks at the end of the day. And if they decide like, oops, we are missing this money. We don't know, like, you know, we don't know what happened. You can't do anything about that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, that was my that was my goal is I just wanted more control over my own business. Hey, man, I remember when a distributor took maybe an extra 90 days to pay us based oh, bro. from when they said they were going to pay us. And that and our stuff wasn't built on that. We avoided that at all costs and built our business from the beginning. So when the few instances that mm. I I had that, I can't imagine living my entire career off of that. Like I mean, imagine ago. like someone else cutting your checks. It, it's it's a little bit better than a nine to five because you're still getting to do what you love, right? right? But someone else is in control of your money. Mm. Um, and even when it came time to getting paid for so pretty, even that check took a whole year. A year? Wow. It took a year for me to get paid for that beat. Why? Because the label was dragging their feet. Like, oh, because so you were still signed to a label. Are you signed to a label? No, now? I mean the the Stars. label that uh, oh. Rayana signed to because yeah. they had to acquire the the beat from me. Got it. Right. They had to buy the master from me. So that was a whole nother story. But um, yeah, it took them a whole year to cut my check for that. Yeah, I had a producer homie break it down to me like this one time, too. He was like, you know, once the beat leaves the producer's hand, the artist is in, in complete control of how successful you are with that. Yeah, beat, essentially. Right. Yeah. So I, I can imagine that being frustrating too, seeing an artist like maybe not or the label, maybe even not push something as, as far as you think it could go and make it as successful as, as you guys think it could be. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, um, and I think I got, I got an advance of like 25 grand for that beat. But imagine if that was my, like if I was depending on that check mm-hmm. for my livelihood, waiting a whole year for that shit. <laughs> like, yeah. come on, man. I can't do that. Yeah, yeah. Just stacking up bills. 
Yeah. And then when you finally get the check, it just disappears because you got to pay the late fees. And right. Everything. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's how that's how it is for a lot of producers yeah. and songwriters and people like behind the scenes that don't necessarily have their own brand. And mm. that's how it is for them. Man, man. So some artists and managers are just waiting for lucky moments when the ones who are killing it have systems to consistently take artists to another level over and over again. And if you want to see what that looks like, we just did a collab where we not only show the system that we use that's resulted in billboard hits, some of the biggest viral moments on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube, but also we got J.R. McKee to break down how he took an artist from zero to one of the biggest hit songs of 2022 and getting a Grammy in January of 2023. This is recent stuff, not old tactics. If you want to check it out, go to www dot brandmannetwork.com slash grammy don't forget the www or it won't work because jr gets into the details of looking at the data decisions that got made how much content got created and how they adjusted the content over time for different parts of the campaign this is real behind the curtains type of stuff so again go to www.brandmannetwork.com slash Grammy, if you want to check this out and apply it to yourself, back to the video. So this is perfect in terms of a segue just to, again, I said earlier, you guys, just the purpose of this podcast, a huge part of the vision is just to help make these financial conversations a norm with creatives. It's too many people that still think the amount of money you have lessens your artistic abilities or having... Or if you have too little money, that means you probably are some goat artist that nobody else understands. It has nothing to do with anything. It's two different conversations, right? Yeah. It's like how people say um, they try to mix like love and happiness or whatever, or uh, love, happiness, and, and money. Those are the three things they, they throw in together. It's like, oh, yeah, making X amount of dollars won't make you happy. I was like, yeah, that's not even the same conversation. Yeah, like, yeah. I need these dollars for this, and then yeah. I'll do my happiness stuff when I work on my happiness. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. Like, and they try to do that with the art, too. It's like, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, you know, connect at right. all. Like, I think that's more of how people should start processing it because we look at Kanye West as a true artist and he got a lot of money. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, 100%. So, like, that should be enough for people to, realize that it's more to this conversation and stop letting people trick you into thinking you should be broke so they can control your life. Right. Yeah. So I love to hear you talk about this and, you know, getting control of your situation just through brand alone, because that level of control, the way you're moving is different than the more control that people have through distributors and some of these companies in the old system, but it's still mm -hmm. not as much as control as it's being marketed to be. Right. Right. So I would love to hear the opportunities that TikTok brought, like people like, come on, like got all condescending. They shitted on you. And I try not to curse because <laughs> of our location, but they, they should. <laughs> y'all don't know. Y'all have no idea. <laughs> but they, they shit on you for what you've done on TikTok, Right. Yeah. But some, 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 right. Um, if this isn't like a, a victimhood, right. But like there's people who just don't get it and, yes. and, and they'll look at whether you have streams or whether you have this music specific brand that based on the traditional route. Yeah. There's a lot of opportunities beyond that, that your presence yeah. on TikTok brought and what you flipped that into. Can you talk about what that looks like? Uh, yeah. I mean, man, the biggest opportunity that came from that was probably the brand deals partnerships, the companies that started reaching out to me, the brands that started reaching out, just wanting to collaborate and work. Because once you have that attention, right, then other people see that you have that attention and they want to leverage that for themselves. And I'm fine with that. Like, it's the music business. Mm -hmm. And so if someone's coming to me and they want to talk business, then I'm all I'm all ears. Um, so yeah, I, I probably did Within a year of So Pretty dropping and all that TikTok momentum, probably did like a quarter of a million dollars in brand deals. And that became like a whole new revenue stream for me and continues to be. So that is like the, the biggest growth part of my business 
Um, it's just doing the brand deals and partnerships. Man. So what did that look like to start? And was it all TikTok based? Like, what well, what was the first brand situation where, where you're like, oh, man, this is more than I, I thought it would, I would get? Um, man, the first brand. I mean, it just happened so fast. Like, um, who reached out? Red Bull, Cover Girl. Cover Girl. Cover Girl. Who would have thought? Hey. Uh, Cover oh, Girl. Pretty, I can see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Walmart, um, AT&T, Kia. Wow. I did... Team USA for the Tokyo Olympics. Um, a bunch of brands like kind of in the music space. Like I have a great relationship with Steven Slate who owns Slate Digital and mm -hmm. um, Steven Slate Audio. So we do a lot of work together. Um, yeah, man, like the list goes on and on. So all that happened around that time of like the TikTok growth and the virality. Got you. Got you. I'm, I think, you know, it's important for people to understand these opportunities like beyond music. So the Slate digital situation is a little different because that's ran more like almost indie and uh, mm -hmm. in, in a way it's not major, major system. Yeah. All right. So first you have those, right? You have the major system, typical things, and then you have these more independently or corporate tight ran music companies. Yeah. And then you have things that are outside of music in general. Yeah. And it seems like from what I've observed, the biggest freedom really starts to come when you get those non music opportunities mm -hmm. and become a figure within that world. Is that something that you saw? hundred percent. Um, and I think that's why it's important when you're building a brand to be conscious of like, all the things that all your interests, you know, because I will say one of the things that I was like very adamant about is only working with brands that I actually use, you know, mm -hmm. services and products that I use in real life or that I'm a fan of, you know. Um, so all the all the brand deals that I've done up to this point are things that I have a personal connection to because that's the only way that I can speak to it authentically. If they ask me to create content around it or make a beat around it or post this, um, I can't, I can't fluff it. You know, yeah. if I, if I'm not a fan of that brand or that service or product, I have to be connected to it in some way. Um, and I think it just translates better for your audience too, right? Like, if you connect with it in that way, then your audience will feel that, and um, and they'll be more they'll be more likely to to connect with it too. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I I think it's such a tricky thing to do. I feel like for somebody starting out, when you're just like you're seeing new money opportunities, though. Like, yeah. Did you see anything where you're like, I don't know, man. It's a nice bag. <laughs> I might want to take this one and really at least or you try real hard to figure out how I can make it authentic. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. But if it doesn't, I, I always go by my feeling, bro. Yeah. Like if the if the gut feeling is not there, I know there's gonna be more bags. Yeah. So it's not about the money at this point. It's about it's about it's more about the long term play and, and and making sure that my brand has real value. Because if I just start co-signing anything and everything mm -hmm. the fans see that yeah. they see that you're not connected to this thing and that you're just you're just getting paid to to promote this thing that you're not connected to and that damages the brand and if it damages the brand long term that means the bags are going to get smaller they're going to dry up and people are going to stop hitting you up so um the, the indication for me that I was doing the right thing and I was promoting and co-signing the right things is that the brand deals keep coming and they keep growing. Mm. You know, that's the indicator to me. I, you know, I got to shout out the Matt Black Tesla. You know, <laughs> because the brand deals probably help fund that. You know, yeah, I'm sure. 100%. I'm sure. Like, um, I bought a new crib in Atlanta. I bought a new car. 
and um you know like i'm not i'm not out here just like throwing money right yeah. like i'm smart about it where i know that the car can be a tax write off for my business mm. where my home that i just purchased uh that can be a tax write off at least some of it because i work from home i right. have my studio in the basement yeah. so i'm in there working every single day um yeah so help me save in taxes for sure speaking of i want to get into some of kato's money tips okay <laughs> you got a post on the gram yeah get a business account yep and write off expenses gear plugins travel etc mm -hmm. speak on that so first thing i would do if i'm making like fifteen thousand dollars a year off of just music income mm -hmm. whether you're an artist a producer engineer whatever First thing I would do is I would open a business account at a bank. Just go in there, like see what kind of business accounts they have and create a separate bank entity um, and also license your LLC with your state, wherever you live. Um, so create an LLC and create a, a separate checking account for that LLC. So you have basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to separate your personal income from your business income. Mm -hmm. So everything is separate. Uh, so that's step one. And then step two, really after that is I would find a good accountant or a CPA. Um, and a lot of times they'll be able to give you tips on like what type of LLC you should set up, um, you know, the tax designation and all of that kind of stuff. Uh and how to write off expenses for your business. So is there a certain time period that you feel like you have to wait before you start this or do you do it day one? I would say if you're making a certain there's like a there's like a monetary threshold, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're not making any money from music whatsoever yeah. or if you're making a small amount it's probably not worth it for you just yet because mm -hmm. uh, you're gonna have to pay to renew your llc and your licenses mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff so um yeah i would say like once you're making 12 to fifteen thousand dollars a year got it off of music got it yeah that makes sense because of the expenses and yeah and, and how you funnel the income well and i need to read this this title Tips on managing finances as a musician or artist, yeah. courtesy of Cato the Track. Let's get to the second one. Okay. Use credit cards with good rewards. Yes. MX, Capital One, et cetera, and pay off every two weeks. Yeah. Um, so the idea behind that is like uh, most of these credit card companies now have like a rewards program, mm -hmm. right? So they give you back things or money in exchange for you using their services, their products. So yeah, one of the first things I did was I opened up a, an Amex credit card because to me they had the best rewards for what I needed. I was traveling a lot at the time, so I wanted to get a credit card that had like good travel rewards. So I got an Amex credit card um, and just started charging all my business expenses to that. And I was making sure that I, I put it on auto pay and was paying off the balance every single month so that I wasn't incurring bad debt. Mm -hmm. Bad debt is like if they're charging you interest every month on the balance that you have on that card, you don't want to pay that interest, right? Because it's going to fuck up your credit and it's just <laughs> going to look bad and you're going to spend more money. Yep. So uh, I was paying off the balance every month and just keeping an eye on my finances and using that card just for my business expenses and getting travel rewards back. So, you know, things like getting a, a getting like TSA pre-check and, um, you know, certain cash back for when you spend at hotels or on flights and stuff like that. Yeah, man, it's, it's a beautiful thing. The first time, like, we had a scheduled trip and I realized we had points that could cover oh, all of it. Yeah. It's like, oh, man, this is, this is great. <laughs> Bro. We don't have to really do the math and, and, and you know. <laughs> Use the system. Yeah. That's what I learned about once I started making money is that the system is set up to work against you when you don't have money. 
Mm. Everything from late fees to overdraft fees. When you look at how many things are set up to work against you when you don't have money, it's insane. Like when I was broke, I was probably spending more on late fees and all kinds of like hidden things. And when I didn't have good credit, you know, I couldn't get a, a loan for a house. I couldn't get a mortgage. I would pay higher interest when I took out a car loan. Mm-hmm. Like those systems are set up against you when you don't have money. So I told myself that once I started making money, I would learn about how these systems work so that I can have it work in my favor. That's a fact. Um, and those are things that you're not taught in school. Now, you should have been broke today, man. Joe, Joe Biden trying to help these <laughs> these folks out. Man, I know you saw the thing about the the mortgage. I mean, the, the credit score. People with lower credit score are getting charged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Less than than higher credit scores. Yeah. So, man, every time I I, know. I figure something out, man, they work against me, man. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah. But generally speaking, like yeah. there's so many little things right. set up to work against you when no, you, when you're poor. For sure, it's literally inertia in each direction like i build momentum being broken then everything cascades in that direction or yeah. i'm starting to get some money and if you keep making those right decisions you know that grows and grows and that's why we always you know hear about the gap growing between the rich and the poor right little details like that is 100%. part of why it happens outside of policies and all these other things just some small decisions uh i mean the, the small ways systems are set up because when i I first start, not when I first started business, because I remember mm-hmm. doing LLCs a couple of times, like when I was younger. But it was when I, um, like did taxes seriously, and yeah. you just start hearing how these things are set up, certain um, advantages, et cetera. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I can see how basically the country is set up for people to be business owners. And if you're not a business owner, yeah. I don't want to say you're fully getting screwed, but you know, there's a lot of advantages to have a business yep. and continue to spend more money and not just sit on that money too, right? So they yep. want you to be a business that continues to reinvest in the marketplace. That's yep. basically what they want you to be. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, with that being said, you specify pay off every two weeks. You just said all, every month, but on mm-hmm. this post you said every two weeks. So what why did you say two weeks there? Um I don't know. I I don't know why I said two weeks, but I pay it off every month. Right. I make sure that I pay off the whole uh, the balances on on all my cards every month. I do. I I also pay taxes every month instead of just once at the end I'm of the year. Yet. Not there yet. Yeah, I mean that's something that I had to learn is because yeah. um, for the first couple of years when I set up my LLC and you know I was starting to make a little bit of money through music, I'd talk to my accountant and it was always like at the end of the year, he'd hit me with this huge number that I had to pay in taxes. And if you're not prepared for that, if you don't have money set aside just for that, that's one of the things about owning your own business. Like you are the one that has to keep an eye on all the cash flow, all the revenue that you have and where your money is going. Right. So if you spend everything that you make as a business owner, you're not prepared for when you got to pay twenty, thirty thousand dollars in taxes at the end of the year. So, um, to kind of to kind of make that blow a little easier, I started paying quarterly, and then once I really started making money, I started paying monthly. So mm-hmm. now I pay taxes every single month, and then I pay at the end of the year too. Got you. But it's less. <laughs> <laughs> and i'm sure a lot less stress yeah as well, exactly as well yeah having clean books is a blessing that's for sure <laughs> yeah yeah um and finding the people that can help you do that right. that's why i say like having a good accountant having a good cpa you know having a money manager or an advisor you know once you get to that point i think is important because it's hard to manage all that stuff yourself and be in the business mm. now Last tip you put on here, set aside 30% of all income for taxes yep. and pay quarterly or even monthly if possible. So yep. there it is. Yep. Yes. There it is. 30% at least. I would say to be on the safe side, set aside 40% of yeah. 
all the checks that you get, all the revenue. Once you get royalties, if you um, sell beats online or if you're, you know, getting checks, set aside 30 to 40 percent of everything that you make. And if I were if I were a new artist, right, I would even set up a high yield savings account. Right. I have a high yield savings account that earns me four point seven percent interest. So I make four point seven percent on the money that on the balance that I have in my savings account. So every month I'm making thousands because if you just have money sitting in your checking account, you're not making any. Yep. You're actually losing money yeah. due to inflation. Right. So that money is going to be worth less and less every single day due to inflation. So if you put it in a high yield savings account, which there are tons of them, um, you're at least fighting, you're fighting inflation, but you're probably also making a little bit of money on top of that just by having it sit there. Yeah. Depending on what era of inflation we're in, at at the very least you're dying slower. Yes. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I'll take that. I'll take that over a quick death. A quick death. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what I love about this post right here is when I look at it, these three tips were was your response to another company's tweet that said, what's your best advice on managing finances as a music producer, right? Yeah. You tweeted that out, all right? Then you put it on Instagram with this beautiful cover. You flashing the money. You got hundreds. You know what <laughs> I mean? <laughs> and then it's a carousel post and the scroll is mm. that, that, uh, that tweet. What does your content team look like to be able to pull something off? Because doing stuff like that and actually having time to think about that is it's not an easy thing to pull off if you're doing all the other things that you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I just recently hired my first kind of social media manager. Mm. So he helps me schedule out content. He helps me edit content, videos, graphics, whatever I need. Um, and I use other tools like I use Sprout Social. I pay, you know, five to six hundred dollars a month just to use that platform, but it helps me manage my entire social media and content ecosystem from one platform. Um, so I'm teaching Jay. Even TikTok. Yep, even TikTok. Mm. Um, I think they're still integrating TikTok in a lot of ways, okay. but yeah, whatever. So uh, I have Jay who helps me on the social media side. Um, I have a personal assistant. Sometimes she'll help me with like finding duets and remixes that people do to my beats and I'll repost those. But yeah, it's just us. And then I have a business partner um, that that helps me. That's across like all my brand stuff. So to me, because that's not a complex operation, right? Yeah. It sounds like content is the culture in your company. They like everybody understands how important content is because yeah you say you just hired this social media person yeah. anything you mentioned your assistant and your manager like they throw in some ideas for the pot so they understand it's important i need to always be looking out for content yeah All right. how did you establish that across the team um just by observing what was working you know because i've been in the game now bro for over 12 years now and that whole time i've been posting content on socials so i got to see firsthand like what works what doesn't work yeah so by now we have a pretty good idea of what is working and what we know definitively for a fact that is working is content and social media being the driver for my business it's not everything right but it is like it is a primary driver for how I get a lot of my business. So we got to make sure that we're on our P's and Q's and that we're like optimizing and leveraging that as much as possible. So yeah, scheduling out posts. Um, so I'm going to start to post like a lot more consistently and a lot more volume on a daily basis, anywhere between like three and four posts every single day across all platforms. That's the goal. How much were you doing before? Maybe once a day or once every other day. And you were a large part of doing that editing and stuff yourself? Yeah, I did everything myself. So the good news is like, because I had to learn how to do everything myself, now 
no one can bullshit me when it comes to social media. <laughs> like you can't try to tell me it's going to cost X amount of dollars for something that I know takes 10 minutes to do, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so now I can like find the right people. I can train them. I can help them understand like how to take certain responsibilities off my hands mm-hmm. so that I can focus more on music and the things that I care about, you know? I love that. Cause I actually remember the first time I interviewed you, like, I don't know. Years. Well, I years remember ago. That. And it was like bad camera, horrible <laughs> stuff. Right. And you mentioned your social media even at that time. And I don't even think so. Yeah. This is pre TikTok and all that stuff. Yeah. But you were meticulous about it. Right. I remember I asked you maybe about volume and your answer was a lot less volume focused, but more the quality of the content mm. but from an aesthetic standpoint, like everything where did that come from and how do you think about that now? Cause now you're going up yeah. volume. Yeah. Right? Does that, does your version of quality still um, exist? Like explain how you see that. That's a good question. I think that quality th- comes through volume and consistency, you know, like I don't really know what quality content means anymore. Mm. If it, if there was one if there was one thing that I could say that matters the most when it comes to content is it's got to invoke a feeling. It's got to make people feel something. Yeah. Right. Whether that's educational or entertainment value, whatever. Like if you post something that makes the audience feel something, then it's good content to me. Outside of that. I don't fucking know. <laughs> I just post shit and see how it does. And the people's reaction and their feedback tells me what is good. Yeah. That's the only indicator that I know. Mm. So I've kind of had to get over what I see as a barrier for most creatives is getting in their own heads about what they think is quality and might not necessarily be the same for what their audience thinks. You know what I mean? I've seen that as the biggest barrier for a lot of creatives, which ultimately stunts their their progress. It slows them down because they get in their own heads too much. I'm glad you said that, man, because you did experience success, right? You saw growth from the way you were posting content before. Yeah. But now, knowing what you know, do you feel like you could have done even better if you weren't so particular in those moments or did, was that just the way that you should have done it at that time? Um, both. Do I think that I could have put out more content? Probably. Well, I mean like experience more success from putting out more content, not just put out more content to do it, but like, would you have been even bigger if you posted more in that time? Maybe With, without your whole, without your brand hesitations. Yeah, probably. Okay. Probably. Um, I don't necessarily regret it because it got me to where I am today. And um, I'm I'm in a great place today. You know, like I have no complaints. But yeah, I think it gets to all of us as creatives. Yeah. Like the us getting in our own way happens to everyone. I don't care who you are. Like you could be at the very top of your game. You could be just starting out we all get on our own way in some way, shape or form. To me, it's just about minimizing that as much as possible. Mm. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I, I've i definitely had some ways that I've gotten in my own way before. And I feel like there's always limiting beliefs in one area or another that you have to go through. But when you're in it, it feels like that's what you're supposed to believe. You know, that's yeah. the problem. That's the problem. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a cyclical thing. Like it's a cycle, Yeah. you know? And if you don't find some way to break that cycle then you just get stuck, you get stuck. And, um, and it, it stops all progress from happening. How do you look at self-development? Do you have a process of how you improve? I think it's just having a a certain level of self-awareness, right? It's like making sure that, and, and a big part of that is keeping good people around you, like keeping a good team around you, people who can check you when you're, you know, like when you're not, 
doing or saying the right things or um yeah just uh being very mindful of your decisions and your actions that's yeah. the only way i know how to describe it because then we start to get really uh philosophical with shit <laughs> <laughs> nah i respect that i respect that so anything to keep yourself from from going too wild right basically right dope dope well i i have to mention the documentary concept mm -hmm. right the, the opportunity that's come to you also basically that came from tiktok yeah. essentially yeah. right uh, can you not, I, I know you can't go too deep into that because it's not in place to talk about yet but that's an iteration of something else an initial idea can you speak on that at all yeah so um around the time that so pretty happened I got invited to host a kind of a reality show. And the whole idea, the whole premise of the show was that they were going to have a bunch of TikTokers with millions and millions of followers um, and put everyone in a house together and challenge them to make the best music possible. Mm. Right. So these were TikTokers that didn't necessarily make music or didn't at least do it consistently, but were, but had huge followings, right? And the whole idea was like, can we turn these TikTokers into full-time musicians and artists? And so because I was like popping on TikTok, they invited me to basically be the host and the in-house producer, um, nice. helping these artists make music. So that was an eight week process. And we lived in upstate New York for eight weeks and just made music. And these were like, you know, I'm a little bit older. These were <laughs> like kids, yeah. you know, like early 20s, still figuring things out. So there were a lot of challenges with just getting them to feel comfortable and secure in their own uh in their own voice you know mm. but yeah it was a it was a wild experience so hopefully that that um that series will be coming to a, a streaming platform soon it's cool to see you have these opportunities that just knock on your door yeah from having visibility and then you have some that you create yourself yeah. like you did your tour yeah, uh, you've done that at least two times uh -huh. at this point, right? So, how do you balance digging into this brand side, all these opportunities that come with having visibility, and being an actual producer? It's tough, bro. I, I won't lie. I think it's uh, it's just finding a balance between everything. I think the music for me right now, at this stage in my career because I've been doing it so long, I have to be, there has to be a spark from somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, it's gotta be, it's gotta be inspired from something. Like I'm not, I know a lot of producers and beat makers that can just sit in their room and make beats all day, every single day. I can't do that because there are so many other parts to my business now that I have to handle. Um, so it kind of comes in waves. Like when I find or I hear an artist that inspires me, I'll reach out. We start working on some music together and I'm like, yo, I love how this feels. Mm. And then we can start working on a EP or something. Right. So perfect example of that is an artist that I worked with recently named Abby the Nomad and um, really, really dope, talented, like super talented artists. And he wanted to make a hip hop album. And bro, like, can rap for real. Like, he kind of started more in, like, a pop lane. But he's a dope artist, like, in general. So we locked in, and we've already made two EPs together. And they've performed really well. And he's completely independent. 
Um, so it's like those kind of scenarios where I'll really dig into the creative, the musical side and put my producer hat on and kind of take off my like entrepreneur business hat and just like focus on the music and really lock in. But it's got to be inspired from somewhere. I can't mm -hmm. just sit in my studio and make beats all day. Got you. Got you. Man. Well, look, man, you shared so much information today. Oh, wait, we not going. No, I'm going to the was, The what? I was about to. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh you were saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Well, unless you had something I'm not ta I'm ta I'm talking about. But I was going to say, but one of the last things I got to make sure I get on the way out of here. He was like, hold on, hold on. It's <laughs> is, is definitely the AI. You talking about AI? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I have to ask you about your perspective on AI because you shared, you know, so transparently how yeah. you felt. I think you called it whack or corny or something, <laughs> what people were doing, man. So, you know, say it with your chest, man. How, how you feel about this AI for real? All right. So I want to clarify, right? Just, just. <laughs> Off top, I am not against AI. Okay. I'm a fan of AI. I think there is a place for technology in the music business, mm -hmm. right? Um, the only thing that I don't like about AI right now is that because there's no policy and regulation around it, it's a fucking free for all. So yeah. anyone can take anyone's voice, put an AI voice on their song, release it, they can distribute it, and you know they can even make money off of it, not legally but they are. And so I don't like the exploitative nature of AI right now because it's not regulated, right? And there's no consent behind it as far as like anyone can take anyone's voice yeah. without permission, yeah. right? That part I don't like. Now I do see us getting to a point where AI becomes regulated, there's policies in place, right? Streaming platforms won't allow you to upload AI songs without the artist's consent. And even one step further, I can see it getting to a place where Drake has a license agreement with this AI company and they can legally let people use his voice on their AI songs so that at least Drake is agreeing to this and maybe it's like branded as a, a Drake AI voice, right? It's like branded as something separate from Drake the artist, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's like a product that. in itself. Um, and then at least it's monetized, it's legal, and, uh, and you get the permission from the artist to use it. So I see us getting to that place eventually. And once that happens, like the floodgates are are open, right? Everyone's gonna be dropping AI songs. Yeah. They're gonna be all over streaming. Um, and I think once that happens, it's going to tip back into a place where people want realness and authenticity. Mm. To me, it always comes back to that, right? Because AI can't replicate authenticity of like, the real thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it'll be interesting, man. I, I think, I think, um, it'll be interesting to see like how this plays out. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that it's becoming popular at the same time as community building is becoming more popular. And yeah. right? it's like a very strong divide down the middle, or that's going to be the great separator. Right. I don't know if you were really, who you say you are, and so I buy this hundred dollar ticket to this thing you have in person. I'm like, oh, okay, that is exactly that is Kato. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And you can you can't, you know, AI will never be able to do that. Yeah, well, you know, when we layer the the bots and the hologram, and the maybe holograms with the <laughs> voice. Uh oh, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. We'll have fucking <laughs> Terminators like performing right in front of live audiences. You put together a, a a bot with the look alike. You know, the whole wax. Face, be like and then you have a chat yeah. bot experience. How they can respond <laughs> and is using Kato's voice. I don't bro. know, man. It's like when uh, with Akon and his double, bro. Like you know, if I could sit at home and send a a double here with Boo when he was sending Boo to shows, yeah, 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 yeah. same, <laughs> same thing. It's insane. <laughs> it's insane. I mean, do I do I think that we'll get to that place? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. 
10 years I'm calling it it, will, it might be faster than that we remember I think you shared the post that Grimes yeah. said you could do that with my voice I saw that too yeah. and Killy I don't know if y'all remember the rapper Killy yeah. yeah, he, he just Killy, made a post um, Can- Canadian rap, yeah, rapper he just made yeah, a post yeah. on TikTok yesterday doing the same thing yeah. but my question is like that's okay right now yeah. that's cool that's cool that I mean I, I'm I'm all for AI but how how are you going to enforce that like exactly. how do you monetize that exactly. you can say it on Twitter but if someone makes an AI song and um, it's also dangerous, right? Because what if they, because it's not regulated right now, what if someone drops an AI song using my voice or your voice and it's like, uh, and it's like a, a neo-Nazi anthem, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And people think it's the real thing. Yeah. Like that could be dangerous just allowing people to use your voice however they want. Well, that's a part of the problem that the AI voice introduces, not just it being unregulated where someone just makes a random song and you don't know it happens, right? Let's just say it is regulated in terms of you getting your percentage, but I don't think people understand the power of, even if I know it's Drake AI, right? right? It being done in my voice, yeah. The same way music sticks in our head. Yes. It could be the right, wrong song. 100%. <laughs> and then it tarnishes your brand regardless. Yeah. Right. Now they're at your show. <laughs> See? Yeah. Say, do the thing that's popular online. Let, let us hear you do it. And, uh, you know, so. Right. Right. It, it blurs like it blurs that line mm-hmm. sometimes. I think that's the most enforceable part of it right now. Like the the brand um, tarnishing. I think that part is somehow legal if something gets big enough. Like it's probably why Eminem was able to yeah. take things down. Mm-hmm. That was probably the argument because it couldn't have been the voice, right? right? We know that, but it's like ah, this is taking over X, Y, and Z. I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so you guys don't listen to me. But I think <laughs> that that might be what it is. Have you seen something though yet outside of okay, they did something in somebody's voice? Have you seen something yet that you were just like, yo, that's really cool though? I mean, yeah, when I listen to these AI songs, I think some of them actually are really good. And I think, you know, I also made a a post about this saying that if songwriters and producers and artists were to use AI as a collaborative tool, right? So if I were to produce an AI Drake song with the ultimate goal of being able to get that in front of Drake, Mm -hmm. not to distribute it to streaming platforms that I can make a lot of money off of it, but to get a placement with Drake. And I was using his AI voice as like the, the placeholder so that the reference Mm -hmm. exactly so that he could hear it and be like, yo, this is dope. I want to cut this record. Life changing. Mm -hmm. My life is changed from that as from using AI as a collaborative tool. I don't see people using it that way yet. Right. But I think there are people that will take advantage of that and probably change their life. Yeah, I wonder if it's happening behind the scenes. Like if some of these bigger artists are reaching out to these AI creators and be like, yo, that is that is dope, let me get that. You know, I, w- I wonder if it is. Yeah, and I would even take it one step further because I have a platform on socials. Like I would post that on my socials and be like, I made this for Drake. Do y'all fuck with this? Mm-hmm. And if, if if the fans like it, they'll react. Yeah. And they might tag him. He might see it. He might not. But, you know, to me, it, it can only, it's only a win from a branding perspective. Yeah. You know, because what everyone's doing now is like making a fake burner account, like mm-hmm. anonymous, and then dropping these AI songs like, it doesn't do anything for your brand and yeah. you can't monetize it and it's not legal. <laughs> so where's the win? You know, like I just don't see it right now. Yeah. I feel like people would have to be more creative to make it a brand where it's more about them instead of, Hey, I just layered this using somebody else's voice. Exactly. It would have to be an approach where it's just like, Oh yeah, he did it differently or where you notice more the construction of it and yeah. you appreciate like who did this that type yeah. of thing but right now it's yeah mostly just layering people's voices on other words and you exactly know, it, and that is not going to be cool in about two weeks you know what i'm saying because everyone's <laughs> going to do the same shit right. and and that's why i say eventually people are going to get tired of it because it's not it's no longer a novelty mm-hmm. right it becomes a commodity 
at that point. Once people start making money off of it legally, it becomes a commodity. And so then we're just going to see the floodgates open. Everyone's going to do it. People are going to get tired of it. And then what are they going to do? Fans are going to come back to the real shit. They're going to come back to the authenticity that comes from a real person's voice. Mm. You know what I mean? So to me, music is never going to be fully replaced by AI. It's just going to be a, you know, AI will be a tool or a side side thing. Yeah, man, what you said to me sounds like great advice for artists, probably any public figure, but especially artists. You know, you're an attraction in moments in time, but sometimes over your career, you won't be the hot trend. Yeah. And there'll be other things that are hotter, whether it's AI tech or another artist. And you got to let the fans turn their head for a while without you feeling like, oh, wait, wait, you know, yeah. you still see me and, and run around to the other side just so you can they can see you. He's like, no, yeah. stay where you are. They're going to turn back around exactly. once that new thing is no longer novel. You just got to give it time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, history proves that like everything is cyclical. Things come back into style that went out and they always come back in mm-hmm. some way. Maybe it's like a little bit different or kind of reinvented in a way but i really do think that if you just stick to the core of what you love then eventually people will find you you know and you're going to be you're going to be at the top of your game in that lane and people will recognize it so i don't think there's any point in chasing trends you know what i mean yeah yeah for sure, man. Now, am I free? Am I free to do it? Am I free to do it? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, no, um, for real, Kato, it was, it was great having you on, man. And, you know, would love to have you anytime you got something to talk about. You feel sure. like you got to get something off your chest. We can arrange it, man. It's been a great conversation. You educated people on the financial part of the game, which is a huge part of where my heart is. So artists can have not only the finances, but control of their destiny so they can continue to create what they want to create and impact the world. So this is yet another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. And we out. Peace.